hey, this is Jonathan Lintola, the CEO of Favor, the decentralized social platform revolutionizing Web3 engagement. And Tommy, the CFO of Favor, we are reimagining the rewards for creators on the block. You're tuned into the Edge of NFT, your source for reimagining and learning what innovative tools like NFTs and the blockchain can deliver. Keep listening. Hey, Web3 Curious listeners, stay tuned for today's episode to learn why Favor is on a path to becoming your favorite decentralized social platform where you get to opt in to data sharing and rewards. And how our guests are looking to create balance between social engineering and social good. And finally, how the early days of selling lottery tickets in newspapers might have predicted what is to come. Let's cue this one up. Welcome to the Edge of NFT, the podcast that brings you the top 1% of Web3 today and what will stand the test of time. We explore the nuts and bolts of the business side and also the human element of how Web3 is changing the way we interact with the things we love. This podcast is for the dreamers, disruptors, and doers who are pumped about this ecosystem and driving where it goes next. Welcome to The Edge of NFT, the podcast created by Jeff Kelly, Ethan Jenny, and Josh Krieger, featuring a variety of top-notch guests and other hosts like myself, Richard Carthon. It's another production of The Edge of Company, a quickly growing media ecosystem empowering the pioneers of Web3 tech and culture and responsible for other groundbreaking endeavors like the Outer Edge LA Innovation Festival. Today's episode features Jonathan Lintala, who is the founder and CEO of Favor, a trailblazer in the digital advertising world. With an extensive background at Google and a key player at Smartly, he has been instrumental in scaling the largest Facebook ad SaaS tool, overseeing $2 billion in advertising and contributing a $500 million exit to Providence Equity. Also, we have Tommy Furquist, who is the co-founder and CFO of Favor, a decentralized social platform. Tommy's diverse background is in finance and business development, including roles at Goldman Sachs, AXA Venture Partners, and as a global head of business development at Daraz, the largest shopping app in South Asia, owned by Alibaba. He has a master's in finance from Alto University and did an exchange in Fudan University at the School of Management in Shanghai. Favor stands as the number one social app on major social web three protocols, including Lens Protocol and CyberConnect, reshaping social media as the web three era merging the ease of web two and web three's control over personal data and rewards for creators. Its user interface reminiscent of popular platforms like Instagram is backed up by blockchain, offering unique decentralized social experience without silos. It's a platform where users can engage with creators, link their NFTs and embrace, embrace a new dynamic social experience. All right, guys, great to have you on the show. Hey guys, great to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I know you guys have been really busy since we got together in Abu Dhabi and um, you guys seem to be traveling the world even more than us. Um, uh, is that is that correct? Is that a fair statement? I think I think it's been an accurate state. I've been staying grounded for the past uh, couple of months because of the very same reason. Uh, I think Jonathan has been traveling slightly less in the past two months as well. But before that, it's been, uh, you know, relatively hectic in terms of the world tour. Yeah, so, been, uh, yeah. I think I had like two and a half extra platinum miles required for Finnair last year because of uh, all the flights back and forth around the world. Yeah, it, 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 you know, it shows the power of in real life connection, even for um, a company building a decentralized social network, right? And I, I guess I just love your broad perspective to kick things off in terms of on all these travels as you guys are seeing how communities look at social media differently. Um, you know, how has that sort of evolved over the past year and, and sort of how has it sort of in, impacted your perspective that's led to sort of building favor? Yeah, I think uh, well, one really cool thing we've been noticing is that uh, like Web3 really is a global community. So typically social media kind of expands sort of one school at a time or one small network at a time. But looking at the favor um, kind of community all around the world, we have people in uh, probably over 100 countries in the kind of active user base. Uh, we've recently rolled out multiple language versions of favor to support that in Japanese, Korean, Chinese, and some other languages as well. But it's really cool to see that uh, people all around the world are coming together with that interest of Web3. And obviously, people have 
slightly different cultural interest in say Japan versus US, but everybody's kind of coming together in um, the shared platform, which has been really cool to notice. Yeah, I, I really like that. And it's from everyone who's listening could hear the very extensive backgrounds of both of you, which are both very impressive. Uh, Y'all come from very different realms. Uh, Tommy, you came from finance. Jonathan, you came from digital advertising. Can you just share a little bit about like how you guys came together to create favor? Yeah, it's a good question. So, uh, so we are we knew each other in in the same university in uh, Finland, but I was studying finance, Jonathan marketing. But then we overlapped uh, in New York. So while Jonathan was at Smartly, and uh, I was doing my um, uh, long long days and nights at, at Goldman in New York, uh, we we kind of uh, overlapped in the same city at that point. And then it was actually through the metaverse that we reconnected again. So I was sending some crazy Instagram stories from Pakistan at the time, working for Daraz, and one of them was saying like, "Hey, what's you know, what what's going on in there? Like, you know, he, he has some cool business ideas. Like, should we you know catch up uh, and discuss those?" So so that's kind of how it uh, evolved, at least like you know, that's my recollection of <laughs> of the time. Yeah, we kind of both had by then realized that we're really not making the world any better by working in our respective roles around the world and at the same time we'd kind of gathered a lot of experience that could be put into better use so then we didn't really know what favor is going to be or whether the name is favor or something else but figure like let's get together and start building something that actually like rule one we have to make the world better not worse and then from there we figure it out and eventually after a couple of um kind of uh, different iterations, we ended up with the Web3 Social, where it can genuinely make the world better if it actually ends up working at scale in the future. So let's see what happens. And when when was that that you guys decided to um, start Favor? So it was 2000 and uh, early 2019 or uh, 2018, December, I guess it could have been when we, when we actually caught up for like a hackathon during the uh, Christmas holidays back in Finland. Um, and uh, I think like both of us had had some kind of, uh, you know, vision that we want to be entrepreneurs, at least it was kind of my path ever since studying finance. And, you know, at Goldman, I was thinking like, okay, if I actually want to work in, you know, what I want to do is in, either invest in technology or be building it. And then the most natural path would kind of go from venture capital to tech company to eventually building something. So I think it was kind of brewing, uh, you know, in the background, at least subconsciously for a while, but, but yeah, 2018, uh, you know, latter part was at least when we kind of connected, uh, and with yeah, initially some detours in, yeah, initially some detours in web two, because, uh, web three wasn't really a thing yet, uh, when we got started, but, uh, step by step, we kind of started realizing the whole need for all of this and really rebuilding social from the ground up, instead of trying to build something on top of, uh, the um, platforms uh, off web to that just keep rugging all of uh, their users and especially anybody building on top of them. Yeah, I think the last few years, there's been heightened focus, like it's kind of like this awakening moment, right, where we all kind of realized, oh, um, you know, we're basically giving up our data um, and access to our lives. And what are we getting in return? And, and what's you know, is this really a fair value proposition for all sides? Um, so, uh, you know, it's been this enlightenment journey, I think, for society over that time. And it's interesting to see how from your travels, this is sort of an enlightenment moment that's sort of crossed all different countries, like where everyone's kind of realized this. And now it's like, what do we do about it? Right. So uh, I'm curious how your ad tech, your finance experience influence your strategies um, in terms of uh, sort of solving this problem and, 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 you know, in terms of how you look at engagement and growth and, you know, as you reflect on sort of the last five years of social media, it's not all terrible, right? There's some things that have worked and there's some things that are broke that you want to fix. So would love for you guys to elaborate on that. Yeah, I think uh, what we've kind of been from the get-go figuring out is that we want to be kind of very pragmatic about what we're building and when you combine kind of my background from 
monetizing social networks and monetizing social media through advertising from his background of understanding how the financial economy of either a IPO or other listing type setups or in general kind of the financial markets work. They're two very important kind of pieces of the entire puzzle where in the end, if we want to fairly reward the people who are creating value, so the creators and influencers and the folks who are doing professional and semi-professional content, there has to be money flowing into that equation. It cannot be pure speculation, so that's where the advertisers can come into play. But at the same time, you need to build it in a way where it's also uh, working in the market uh, and especially in a token market uh, that brings in a lot of uh, different intricacies into the process. But we think that kind of those two plus actually focusing on the ethical side of things are the winning combo. So you have to be very pragmatic. It's not about being too technical, not about being too idealistic, but at the same time, really understanding that if you're too idealistic about let's create something that's ultimate freedom of speech for everyone, you're going to be banned everywhere because freedom of speech for everyone means also the really, really bad guys who are banned for a reason. Or if you build something that's free forever for everyone, you're not going to be able to reward anyone and you're not going to be able to run a business. Yeah. So how do you, how do you balance that freedom of speech issue? Cause that's, that's a, that's a hot topic. If there is one right now. Yeah. I think it's uh, always been, one and I think one really cool part of Web3 social when you think about the decentralized aspect of that, so not really social fi and all of those reward mechanisms. It's the fact that if you're building the on-chain graph like Lens Protocol is, then that's essentially the accountability in the background where we can obviously censor people from favor. But since we're essentially only the front end of that and Lens is an unopinionated back end of that, it means that we can choose to censor somebody, but we cannot choose to remove somebody's profile or remove somebody's connections. On YouTube, uh, I've been in a bunch of interviews where um, the person might have had a huge reach previously on YouTube, and then uh, they ended up uh, fighting with YouTube and all of a sudden got banned entirely. And we've all seen the influencers and crypto KOLs who've been losing their entire audience. So that's where if one person can be the judge, jury, and executioner, that's a very dangerous premise. Whereas it's scary. Yeah. Speaking, you know. yeah, I mean, look, like uh, we've seen our YouTube audience grow uh, demonstratively over the last year. Um, as we're recording this, we're a little over 70K and I think we're at 10K maybe just six months ago, right? So I think on one hand, Richard and I are really excited about that. On the other hand, we're like, man, what if, what if we trip? What if we do something wrong? Um, we're, we're, what happens to our audience? Um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it does create anxiety because there's so much work that goes into building trust, building community on one platform um, where you have to make choices. Uh, back at the beginning, you know, Clubhouse was really popular and, and everyone was saying, why don't you guys do your podcast on Clubhouse? And we're like, well, we're just going to go traditional. We're going to go against the grain. I'm so grateful we did because we all know what happened to, to Clubhouse and in, in that strategy. So it makes a lot of sense that you guys are sort of solving that in that creative um, way. Uh, Tommy, any anything to add to the conversation here in terms of, um, you know, some of the pillars of, of favor? Yeah, and I think we got a good, you know, Jonathan has seen how kind of sausage is made it when it comes to spying people and you know monetizing in the in the kind of old world or what we hope to be the old world and we're creating a new one i think one uh, kind of realization for me was uh just like what is different in web3 essentially like that's our goal to basically give you know early contributors uh kind of a vc type of a return potential so the earlier you join the network the higher your reward should be because of the more effort you will put into, you know, bootstrapping the network, bringing your friends in, and that would have been impossible in Web two. So even if, you know, let's say, I knew that Facebook is going to be Facebook, like how could have I invested in Facebook? I literally would have not, yeah, unless I would have convinced Peter Thiel that hey, take my small two thousand dollar check in. Versus in Web three, like you know, the people who actually believe in the system. They can actually with this open system kind of you know either put you know their time into it to build it so that's how they get rewarded by the tokens from the user pool 
or you know invest uh, some small amount through you know you know private community sale or crypto exchange. So I think that's fundamentally different, like how you split the pie basically. So in in you know Web three you predetermine the pie, and then you say like this is how it should be in the end game. Versus in Web two you start with the whole pie, and then you start diluting, and then you know most of the returns might have gone uh, you know just the VCs and whoever happened to be, you know, sitting in the right place with the, you know, capital and so forth. So I think like that's a very like democratizing aspect of, of Web3 and like, you know, how I all especially think think about that in, in you know, uh, social networks context. Yeah, yeah. and, and I, I really like that. One of the things that really drew my attention to Web3 um, was the concept of read, write, earn. Um, a lot of companies in Web2 um, you, you are the product, right? Because you're helping them grow this big, massive audience and eyes and attention, but you don't really see a lot of the benefits. Whereas in Web3, you can come out the gates with some of those benefits if you align yourself uh, with a, a company or a project that are building and creating the type of ecosystem and features that you want to be seeing. And, you know, Jonathan, you kind of talk to, you know, around uh, a, a lot of different ways that you're creating features, like and uh, in, in, in looking at things like freedom of speech. And Tommy, you just kind of talked about, you know, the ability to, to earn while building um, out this economy and other stuff like that. But you have a lot of really cool things coming up, like points economy 2.0, uh, which is right around the corner for you guys. And I've heard you've got some other pretty cool features coming up. Can you tell us about how these uh, new features are being displayed and are being shared and and uh how is this amping up the autonomy on your platform yeah we're still working on a six-year name then point economy 2.0 but i think as a product it's actually going to be a very nice upgrade so for the last two years we've been working on building a point economy inside the app that would be fairly rewarding those people who are actually contributing value while discouraging farming, botting, and all of the other major issues that uh, Web3 and Web2, for that matter, have in their earning models. So obviously, telling people that if you keep liking everybody, then you get an airdrop is not the great strategy. You're going to be getting tons of spam, and you get fake engagement, and you have no way to tell which one is real. So we've been putting a lot of the focus and effort on instead of maximizing the amount of users, we're maximizing the amount of genuine users, and that's where the point economy also comes into play. So the setup essentially has a reward pool for the posters, and then what we call in the next version, the favors. So the people choosing their favorite posts uh, each day. So depending on your level in the app, you get uh, five or more faves uh, when you've leveled up to level two and above. And then you can cast those each day on your favorite posts. And with this sort of decentralized voting system, we're hopefully able to get to a point where we can reward those people who have genuinely been creating interesting posts that others actually choose as their favorites from a finite pool of uh, votes you can cast each day, and then we can reward them. But at the same time, we can also reward those curators who have helped us uh, get the best posts surfaced each day. And uh, again, if we make it work well enough, we can actually replicate that TikTok virality mentality where it's not always the influencers and it's not always the famous people getting all of the votes. But if you're actually early on posting something that's fun and engaging and interesting and people start choosing it uh, when you post it, you can actually rise up the ranks and keep also then uh, not just getting impressions, but actually starting to accumulate points which will be then part of uh, the airdrop mentality in the future. So trying to figure out who actually earns it instead of who's been randomly farming it the most. I like Very that. Cool. Um, I like that a lot. Um, Cause you touched on a lot of the problems that do exist on current platforms or even some web three companies that have tried to go after what it means to create a, a decentralized social network. And unfortunately the incentives align with the kind of results that you didn't want ultimately. Um, so by putting these practices in place, it actually gets the results you want, but also makes the the content and the people who are creating it and just consumers, consumers who are just coming on to enjoy what people are creating to actively part, participate and not just see it as a job. Um, so I, I do like the setup that y'all are doing with that. Yeah, it's very cool. I, I, I had another question, but before I jump to that, um, just to follow up on this, um, because Richard and I and the Edge team, we've thought about sort of 
this world of community first, which, you know, has been, you know, the epicenter of Web3 for the last two years. And there's sort of this antagonism towards advertisers, but, but you all don't have that sort of perspective um, in that, you know, you're, you're sort of pro ad tech if, if, if it's used in the right way. Could you elaborate on, on that part of the economy a little bit more? Because I think it's a really important differential. Yeah, I think if you think about the ways that uh, people and platforms can make money, there's the proven and most scalable model so far has been advertising because the reality is that most people in the world are either not willing or able to pay for things online. And they're kind of used to the fact that their social media is going to be free and things like that. So kind of the most viable model is that there is at least an option for advertising that comes in it. And there's obviously a very big difference between the current setup where Facebook tracks your phone GPS, they track uh, every site you visit, every e-commerce product you look at in every e-commerce store out there. They read your messenger discussions um, and all that is done to create and targeting graph of you and you have no way to opt out of that. So even now European Union forced Facebook or meta companies uh, to start offering the paid subscription. But the only thing that does is uh, it no longer shows you the advertising, but it's still tracking you just as invasively as before. So if you're using any of uh, the Web2 social products, there's no way for you to opt out of that. And we see the first of all, it doesn't have to go that far. Like we don't want to track anybody's GPS. I'm not going to sleep at night if that's uh, the monetizing model we have. And at the same time, there's actually a lot of things that people are voluntarily willing to give if they actually get a share of the pie. So we're looking at it from a way where if you want to give us more information about your interests and what you want to be seeing, uh, for example, using referral codes, if you buy from an ad on favor in the future, then you will be getting a essentially a cash back in the form of points. So we want to also bring back sort of revenue share for the people who are engaging with that ecosystem. And then if you don't want to see any advertising, you don't want to be tracked at all then there's always the option of uh, just subsidizing. So you pay a certain amount of points and then we wouldn't be showing you advertising. This is obviously not all live yet because uh, at this point, it doesn't make sense to build uh, the advertising system before we've uh, reached a certain mass of users, but we've been kind of building that model for quite a while. So we already have sort of the plans of how to make something that's both scalable and ethical and profitable for that matter. Yeah, I, I, I love that. Um, you know, it, it's sort of this opt-in model versus opt-out, right? And in in that context, I, 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 yeah, I think a lot of people do do want and are fine with that. Um, you know, we live in a consumer economy where consumers have certain expectations. I think um, of of what's completely free, but it comes from a world where advertisers have been subsidized them and it's been an involuntary exchange of information, right? So I think there is a consumer education shift happening right now as part of this awakening. And I think the model that you guys are pursuing, I personally align with a lot more and it's how we've thought about our own community and what we can do with that community going forward. So excited to see how all that comes together. Um, Another thing that we wanted to, to talk about is just this concept of decentralized social, um, you know, obviously this has been cooking for quite a while. It's not easy to, to build something like this. It's quite disruptive when just the concept itself. And then when you talk about integrating blockchain, obviously um, I think blockchain has some inherent advantages to make this possible, but also some challenges and would love to sort of delve into you know, the process of integrating blockchain, into the DNA of favor, and what have been some of those challenges that have influenced the platform's development? Yeah, so well, one of the first choices we made back in the day was that we don't want to build, at least initially, our own on-chain social graph, because then if we are the only holders of that social graph, we're essentially giving people a key, but we can change the locks at any given point. So you're not giving real ownership without interoperability. And then we started talking uh, with Stani and the crew at Aave who were building Lens Protocol and realized that this is exactly what we need to solve that issue. So we need to be building on a third party graph that actually has also others building on it. And that way the interoperability and therefore accountability 
come in from day one. And it's been a journey of uh, close to two years already building on Lens. And obviously, they're not fully ready yet. Farcaster is not fully ready yet. Nobody in the market has yet kind of cracked the entire how to scale to hundreds of millions of users kind of a setup. And it's still an iteration of how do you balance the actual decentralized nature and ownership of stuff with cost efficiency, convenience, speed, and all that. So if you build a fully on-chain social network, it's going to be very expensive, very slow, and very hard to use, but fully decentralized. And that's never going to hit the mainstream. But if you go too far, then you're actually no longer decentralized. You're just going to be another Web2 app with a bit of um, blockchain somewhere, at least in your slide deck. So you need to find that balance in between. And I think currently pretty much all of the major players are finding that where ownership of your profile and relationships are the stuff that should be on chain, but not every single cat video needs to be on chain. So there are posts and DMs and likes and stuff like that, which is going to be very expensive. And you do tons of those every day should not be on chain, but I think the balance well, is here. Think, this year we'll get there. There's some, uh, there's some cat lover video lovers out there. that are going to strongly disagree with you. <laughs> I was going to say too, I, I disagree with some cat video. Yeah, so some of them deserve it, but not each one of them. So I think they need to be served their place on chain. If we're talking about dog videos, 100% on chain, but, but cat videos, I'd say about 10%. <laughs> Well, Thanks, in that too. regard, I know you have a ton of different, you know, communities that you've been working with, and uh, you actually have some new updates for favorites communities. Um, I want to dive into that just a little bit more because uh, one of the things is that there's a NFT integration that's coming up, uh, as as long as well as a ton of other uh, really cool updates. Can you kind of just expand on those? Yeah. So one of the big features that we see in social media for Web3 is that not just relying on Lens and the other social graphs, there's also NFTs that actually bring a huge amount of social context and community and credibility into the game. So let's say you're an owner of a Pachi Penguin or a Board Ape. That means that uh, you are quite legitimate. You are pretty much um, an industry insider or you have too much disposable income. Either way, it's something that builds up your credibility and shows that you're a real legitimate user, but also it means that you should be able to access exclusive communities with those assets. So we really see that those NFT projects that have had community building at their core instead of just speculation are the ones who have survived the bear market and have been thriving. And they are the ones that we're partnering up with. So Pudgy Penguins, for example, is a partner and a launch partner for the communities, and they've been doing a phenomenal job building the community out and obviously the brand and the franchising business and everything else around that. But we've been visiting their events in Miami and in Hong Kong and all around the world. And there really is a essentially fan base community for Pudgy holders. And these are the communities we want to bring on board online. So essentially, instead of all of these janky uh, sign up with this Discord bot with your valuable NFT, we want to make sure there's one quick, safe, rug proof way to authenticate all the wallets you want to authenticate and then we give you access to everything you deserve so if you have a pudgy in the wallet you can join that exclusive community the crypto punk will unlock the crypto punk community and so forth but more interestingly we've also seen a lot of the KOLs recently start minting their own nfts often like free soulbound tokens that are gay to their community so if a Bulduk, who's one of our advisors in Turkey, uh, has over a thousand people already who are actively participating in his soulbound token gated community on favor, and we're really seeing that that's potentially one of the most interesting ways for creators to start building real communities that can be validated and you can track each member because you have a connection with their wallet now that you've given them a soulbound token. So nobody can ever take away from you that connection between you and the audience you've built with NFTs. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, I think it was a real challenge that we saw in this last bull run. Uh, usually people either said go to Discord or go to Telegram and both can get pretty noisy. And also just for new people who want to be part of these communities that are more on the Web 2 side that are trying to transition over into Web 3, uh, it's almost a non-starter because even after they finally figure out how to do all of these things, the commitment to then like having to do more and more to stay engaged with that audience has been a big hurdle. So if y'all are helping to bridge that gap and to make that 
experience a lot easier and make it a little bit less noisy uh, with being able to communicate and engage with with audiences like that. I think that's going to be a massive opportunity, especially for uh, KOLs or, or even potential up and coming KOLs who want those small net communities. Because I know people uh, who aren't necessarily a KOL, but have a small tight community that give each other alpha that would like love something like this. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to, to hear about this and, and want to go check it out myself. Yeah, I, I think you guys are getting to a, a major pain point um, that we can speak to as, as KOLs, right? Um, I guess you can call us that. I don't know what we are. Um, but, but, you know, we've got Telegram stuff going on. We've got Discord stuff going on. We've got YouTube stuff going on. We've got Twitter stuff, Instagram stuff, you know, LinkedIn stuff. And it's just like, it's overwhelming in terms of where do we actually, what is home base for us in our community? And what are we giving up if we choose one of these places to be home base? And then something happens, the, the floor drops out, Twitter stops using communities, which is a feature of Twitter. And then where's our community? Telegram, you know, implodes. I mean, there, you know, there's a, a lot of different scenarios that, that I, I think essentially give me inertia when it comes to these types of decisions. And it sounds like you guys are getting to the heart of that with this uh, solution. Yeah, that's yeah. a huge huge blocker for anyone in the sense that if you're trying to build your community on a rented platform, whether it's Telegram or Twitter or YouTube, it means that you'll never be able to own the community and the relationships you're building as long as they're operating on the Web2 model. So you've only got them as long as the platform remains popular, as long as they keep your channel. And we've, for example, been recently seeing that we used to reach about 100,000 people whenever we tagged at everyone on Discord in the server we built of real legitimate users. And then now all of a sudden we're reaching 5,000 or 8,000 and Discord says there is no bug and that's normal, but somehow they rugged us off over 90% of the genuine user audience that we've been building. But we know they're genuine people. We've been talking with them for almost two years, but yeah, yeah we got, there we no got, complaints to be had. Yeah, we definitely got throttled on Twitter. I, I'm 100% sure of it. Um, and it happened like overnight where like people that have been liking and engaging with our posts just all of a sudden weren't, weren't seeing them, um, including like people I know. So it, and, and, and this was sort of, you know, I think a budget issue for them or, or change in leadership. I'm not sure, but it's been frustrating because now you have to get the, the check mark and do different things and, and just to get you know, back to where you were with the, uh, the level of engagement that you had. So it's it's frustrating. Um, but alas, let's talk about the ecosystem a little bit more in depth. Um, you know, you mentioned there is a, a token component, um, you know, uh, not financial advice, but what are, what are some, some of the utility aspects of the token going to be in the future? Yeah, and actually, uh, on, on, before we dive into the token more, I just wanted to give a shout out on the community side, for example, to uh, uh, Carla Moni building Moniverse and uh, Jesse Jeans building uh, Fry's platform. So we've seen some cool examples where people are actually, because you can actually verify the community with the NFT, and that's going to be the only group where you actually, you know, interact in a verified way, and then you might have Telegram and something else on the side where the kind of, you know, the messaging flows, but then, you know, someone could cheat their way in or whatever. But I think that's like some kind of cool early signs of people, you know, at least believing it, like, you know, maybe mo not most of the messaging is not there, but it's still like their go-to place to start building, um, basically building that community. And for the token utility, you know, obviously the biggest uh, thing is to kind of bring back to, uh, to the holders of, of the token and kind of, you know, have that rewarding mechanism where essentially, I think the best way to think about it is like, you know, when you're building in Web3, you're not building a company, you're building a village. So it should be like as meritocratic as possible. And then people can take like different roles, uh, you know, depending on like how much they want to contribute in the system. And then they get rewarded by the currency, which is in that ecosystem, which essentially is the token. Then hopefully with, you know, regulation, 
becoming clearer. You can give like more explicit governance rights and kind of these type of equity, uh, like actual, um, you know, governance rights, which is very difficult to, to promise explicitly right now. So right now we are more focused on kind of making sure that, you know, there's utility for the token where in social, obviously going to be like, you know, you can use the token for visibility, whether you are an advertiser or an individual, or, you know, you can get more of it by doing subscription, like a Patreon or Substack model. But essentially what we want to build is this meritocratic, you know, village, which will then kind of, uh, you know, use the token as its native currency, uh, both as kind of the oil of the system, as well as kind of governance uh, instrument. But Jonathan, maybe you can compliment on my long ramble <laughs> around. Yeah, yeah, it's while you're doing that, uh, Jonathan, if you could talk about sort of how you sort of envision integrating with NFTs, you mentioned the soul bound component, but just want to make sure we cover that fully as well in terms of how the token and the NFTs will interact. Yeah. So that that's definitely one of the potential uh, utilities where right now we haven't minted any NFTs for favor. One of these is uh, the like unclarity with Apple, where they're pretty much saying that utility NFTs are bad. So you're not allowed to have utility NFTs in your iPhone app, but hopefully now the European Union is starting to um, like strangle them with certain legislation and stuff like that. So maybe in the near future, they realize that uh, utility NFTs are actually the future and not a threat for them. So we can actually start doing more on that front. And there obviously would make a lot of sense where you can meet the, your stuff with the favor tokens, might be doing it already in between. But if you think about kind of metaphorically how a Web2 mobile app would be operating versus Web3 mobile apps. So if you look at, for example, Supercell, who's been uh, extremely successful with Clash of Clans, Heyday, uh, Brawl Stars, and a bunch of other mobile games making tens of billions uh, of dollars with in-app purchases, and obviously giving Apple 30% of that. So Apple is also very happy. But the entire model is that people pay to play the app because or the game because they are so happy with it. And then um, Genius for Supercell, they get to keep all that money. They don't give any of that back to the successful players. The web free model where people actually have more ownership through actually owning their social graphs in the favorite case, then we need to make sure that they're actual stakeholders and not just the cash cows in the equation. So then it means that the tokens are the way to kind of get liquidity if you are one of the successful ones who's been earning tons of points. You can go and sell those in the market. And then at the same time, there's going to be the newcomers and the people who want to grow and the brands who want to advertise who need more points that they can actually redeem for a cheaper rate with that token. So we do plan to roll out enough purchases. But if you don't want to pay Apple 30%, you can actually save the 30% by buying with the tokens, which is going to be one extra step, but a significant saving. So especially if you need a lot of points, you can go to the market and buy them back uh, in the form of tokens. So this way we hope to build a system where people have liquidity for the points they've been earning. And at the same time, they can buy them directly from us or they can buy them from the market and from the village market, essentially. Therefore, bringing all the stakeholders into the table. Yeah, I like it. It's a it's a full circle ecosystem um, that, you know, again, brings a lot of the utility and, and a reason for the token. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of projects and ecosystems uh, where the token was created, but more as an afterthought and not really being truly integrated into what's going on. Uh, but y'all are clearly being very thoughtful about how this was going to help um, the end users and, and keep fostering more use cases uh, within the Favor ecosystem. So thanks for expanding on that. And thanks for expanding on everything that you did today. Obviously, Favor has a lot of really cool things being built and, and, and things that people are excited to use, but you know, as we kind of wrap this up and go before we go to our next segment, I wanted to ask you both, you know, what are you most excited about and what can users look forward to in the near future? Yeah, it's a great, great question. I think like, you know, we are definitely in the middle of the perfect storm in, in many ways. Like, you know, I think it's the right time that someone is going to build something in decentralized social. And we've been, you know, lucky to be building at the specific moment and you know, working with people like, you know, Lens and CyberConnect and Mockaverse and, and you know, kind of, uh, you know, rowing in the same boat with, with all these other cool projects. So I think like, you know, that hypothesis is kind of starting to prove itself more and more as we, as we go along. 
Um, and, and I think like, you know, this year feels like it can be, um, you know, revolutionary from kind of proving the next wave of, of, of Web3 and in, in crypto adaptation in general. So, um, you know, we are very, very excited while uh, we have a lot of wood to chop to kind of try to digest and, and, and process everything. But that would be like on top of my mind, uh, the, the thoughts I have or the feelings I have right now. Yeah, I think it's been very exciting to see that in a way, sort of all of the things are coming together at the same time and same kind of point in time where the technology is starting to be ready for more scaling. So Lens and CyberConnect and uh, Farcaster and Mochaverse and all of these guys have tech that can actually 10x or 100x uh, without hopefully breaking down. At the same time, we're seeing kind of the early signals of another bull run, which isn't technically needed for social media success and we could obviously do it without it, but that's usually the thing that gets a lot of uh, fresh meat into the system. So people come in, they become curious and that can mean that we can actually onboard 10 times or hundred times more people than we would in a market where people don't feel like they could be making uh, any profits out of the system. So if that's the way to onboard the noobs into the system and also make them some money instead of make them lose all their money even better. So I think uh, very excited about seeing where 2024 is going with the entire market, but especially with social. Nice. Well, I, I'm pretty confident people listening to this right now are going to be uh, excited to go check out Favor. But I personally am ready and excited to learn more about both of you. So we are now going to start our next segment, which is Quick Hitters. NFTLA returns as an inclusive week of community events throughout LA, celebrating the outer edge of innovation. Builders be building. There's so much energy colliding around gaming, AI, generative art, the metaverse, decentralized social, and the future of entertainment. If you want to be in the mix, including the official free NFTLA celebration, visit outeredge.live to subscribe for your updates in RSVP. Edge quick hitters are a fun and quick way to get to know you a little bit better. There are 10 questions and we're looking for a, just a short single or a few word response, but feel free to expand if you feel the urge. Are you both ready? Good to go. All right, Tommy, we'll start with you. Uh, what is the first thing you remember ever purchasing in your life? Pocket cards. So uh, I, I used to have these collectibles, which uh, I think I had done something, you know, some home course or whatever to get some money from my dad and I bought the hockey cards. I had some really cool ones with like hologram uh, covering, but that was kind of something which resembles to degree NFTs, but was not as unique and not verifiable on blockchain. But yeah, that nice. would be the first. I like that. What about you, Jonathan? Yeah, I guess that's kind of the Finnish thing where I do remember that uh, those were all the rage. So going around and buying those packs and hoping there's going to be a valuable card in those, I still have all of my hockey cards from the 90s somewhere. They're probably not worth anything nowadays, but still have the folder. That's nice. awesome. Well, what was the first thing you purchased? A uh, Jonathan? Um, I think kind of, yeah, probably the hockey cards are the first thing I remember purchasing. Probably candy is where most of my money went as a kid, but that's not as memorable. <laughs> Gotcha. So on the flip side of it, though, um, what is the first thing you remember selling in your life? I was very entrepreneurial, so I was actually selling lottery tickets, uh, which is apparently against the law, uh, making your own lottery as a six year old. But we wanted to buy a hamster with my friend and luckily never made enough money to buy a hamster. But try to get a... lottery tickets. <laughs> that says so much about you and, and your journey. Uh, that's all I really needed to know. Circle. That that's great. That's awesome. What about you, Tommy? Uh, now I now I understand, Jonathan, why you like the hamster topic so much when it appears <laughs> in, uh, in favor as well. <laughs> that's that's super cool. Uh, I was actually I had kind of similar. So newspaper street vendor was the first thing I was doing uh, as kind of at least what I remember having having sold, um, and that was going partially to charity for like the junior football team, but we also made like one euro per uh, magazine. So there was a bit of a competitive pressure, like who's actually the biggest 
seller who bring brings back the, like you know the biggest amount of you know uh, meat and nuts back to the camp so i think it was a cool exercise to to kind of train selling and persuading people to to buy you you may not have realized this but but there was some equitability in that model that maybe has inspired you around favor right because <laughs> at least you know there was social good and you got something in return so it's a win-win-win yeah so, that's true. Sure. It's a it's a it's, it's a good deep thoughts on that one. So I um, should think about maybe maybe the influence. Yeah, the there's something point. there's something to the whole story now that you can you can you can add that to uh, thanks to this podcast. All right, so you're up first this time. What is the most recent thing you purchased? Uh, at the at the pool. <laughs> well, happy All birthday! Right. It sounds like it was a fun time. Thanks. <laughs> yes. Indeed. And Jonathan, what about you? Yeah, I think technically I expensed it, but I bought the new Apple headset because um, I'm a fanboy, so I have to buy all the stupid uh, new things. It's apparently going to be very heavy, so I'm going to have a strong neck soon. There you go. But definitely something you need to uh, to live in a decentralized world. And, and you know, I think Favor is going to be probably about 20 hours of your life a day. So uh, pretty much everything is probably in the company at this point. <laughs> um, pretty much. <laughs> And, and uh, you again, uh, what is the most recent thing you sold? Yeah, on the flip side, uh, we're now decorating our new office uh, for the company, the first kind of office of our own. So I finally decided to get rid of my massage chair that was behind me right there in that empty space. Uh, until today, I sold it to the company. So now it's going to be in our lounge area to make sure that the rest of the company can enjoy it as well. And people don't make fun of me for having a massage chair in the middle of my living room. There, there you go. I was um over the holiday. There was a massage chair at the Airbnb we stayed at, and uh, you know that thing was was well used. You had to like wait in line if you wanted to uh, get in that thing. So I'm sure it's going to be a popular addition. Tommy, what about you? Yeah, and a nice timing just before the podcast, Jonathan. We managed to <laughs> pair it off. Uh, mine was actually also furniture, so I still had some. So um, I recently moved to to uh to dubai mainly for regulatory and other uh reasons but um sold some furniture from the old home back in back in the north nice uh yeah moving uh, i feel like furniture is always one of the first things to go or improve and you're like all right let's let's go for it so um so uh Jonathan, we're going to start with you on this one um what would you consider your most prized possession yeah I'm Trying not to take the easy way out and talk about NFTs, but I think one of the things I actually have right in front of me on my wall here is a um, Scrooge McDuck drawing by uh, Don Rosa, who's uh, one of the biggest artists for the Noel Duck comics. And I used to be a big uh, fan uh, when I was uh, a kid and he every now and then came to Finland. So I always went to queue in and eventually was able to talk him into drawing me uh, one original and I've still got it on my wall. And I think that's kind of, uh, don't know what the financial value would be, but that's uh, still one of the most valuable things. Like if the house burned down, that's the thing I would probably grab when I'm running out. <laughs> that's awesome. Hey, one of one is, is incredible. Um, and uh, yeah, the sentimental piece is always cool too. So really cool one. Uh, Tommy, what about you? Yeah, I think it would be some uh, crypto swag t-shirts or other swag from from the best projects that we've been working with at least it has the most sentimental value so you know we are still grinding in the trenches and don't have like too valuable assets Can't afford clothing. Yeah, yeah yeah exactly so but, and uh, i do have a one nft but it's technically our our treasury nft as well the more covers one which is like eight thousand uh but yeah i would say sentimentally the some of the swag that i have yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't blame you. There's some really good uh, swag you can get while on the road. Uh, I know Josh and myself rack up when we when we go overseas. Man, yeah, too much swag. Here. But um, yeah, we'll we'll have to uh, we'll have to see about getting you guys in the Edge of NFT Hat Club. We've got we got some of these limited edition hats still still around somewhere. Um, in the in the heyday of of Web three, these things can get you into like you know, a nightclub in, in kind of in front of the line. So they're pretty, pretty cool utility on, on these hats, Edge of NFT. And um, yeah, shout out to the Mochaverse guys. We, we're, 
we also work with them a lot and um, you know have had a regular segment with them on the show and also own quite a few mochas. So excited to see uh, them continue to create value in the ecosystem. So nice there. Um, awesome. Well, uh, Tommy, have another question for you. If you could buy anything in the world, digital, digital physical, service experience, et cetera, uh, that's currently for sale, what would it be? I guess it's technically not for sale, but at least like, you know, you could, uh, you know, you, you could invest or contribute capital expenditure to it. So I would upgrade some of the sewage systems in, in the world. And this mainly comes from my experience when I was working for this Alibaba company in uh, Pakistan, I realized one morning, like, oh, what's this, you know, smell and realized that most of the stuff, just because they don't have the infrastructure yet, uh, you know, goes unfiltered into the ocean. So I realized like, shit, if I can, you know, contribute into something like this would be probably a good thing to put into all of these cities, which don't have a choice right now uh, to, yeah. you know, put it elsewhere. So that's definitely something which, you know, I would, I would be buying if I had the money. Literally, literally you had a, oh shit moment, <laughs> but <laughs> quite but, literally. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And this goes for third world countries and second world and first world countries have this issue, right? This is just generally a, a, a problem. I'm, I'm with that. That's the original answer answer, but I'm, I'm totally with you on that one. And I also want to say, yeah, that's the first time, uh, very admirable that you choose it to like help others. Uh, so really cool. Um, and also just, you know, another reminder of just like, uh, for me to be grateful for, you know, something as simple as proper sewage just in, in my own city. So definitely appreciate that answer. So Jonathan, what about yourself? Yeah, we can't sound too altruistic. So I'll just say that uh, the kind of top of my bucket list is still buying a private jet kind of that's when I know I'm going to be made like everything. Well, else what kind of jet are we talking? Are we talking G3, G4, G6? Yeah, I think probably like with once I get my entry level jet, then I'm gonna be wanting a bigger jet because that's how human mind works. But uh, kind of well, getting your awesome. first jet is gonna be kind of a milestone. I'll um nice. I'll get the specs on it, Jonathan. But um I flew in a private jet from uh from uh where was it um Salt Lake City, Utah to L.A. with Baron Davis because um there was a jet company that sponsored the event that we were both at. And it was a, it was the most sustainable, safest jet in the world. So there is an option out there for you that could sort of check all those boxes. I'll, I'll get the specs for you. Um, pretty, pretty cool jet. Pretty, pretty amazing. We just felt like we were levitating. Baron was in the, the co-pilot seat. Um, I think, I think he, I fell asleep. He may have been driving the plane for all I know. Um, all right, next question is for uh, Tommy again. If you could pass on one of your personality traits to the next generation, what would it be? Yeah, I think it would be grit and perseverance. So, you know, no matter what, kind of just keeping on going and refusing to die, whether personally or as a, as a company. So I think it's not my spirit animal, but there's some resemblance to a honey badger in, to, to a certain degree. So I would probably about pass on that gene. Uh, I love that. Know, That's spring cool. alive. David Goggins style. Just keep going. <laughs> yes. And Jonathan, what about you? Yeah, I think it would be something of like a drive for things, whether it's ambition or just kind of always aiming for the next bigger thing. It's at the same time also very frustrating, but I think that's the way I can actually drive the biggest impact. And the more people we have with a lot of drive, I think the more the world will also benefit from that. Yeah, keep keep thinking bigger. I love that. All right, and you again uh, for this question, Jonathan. If you could eliminate one of your personality traits from the next generation, what would that be? I think kind of uh, like lack of focus uh, and like being able to concentrate is probably one of the biggest, I guess, sort of like things for everyone nowadays. Where when I was a kid, I was still able to sit and read a book, but now being able to focus on something for more than five seconds in a row is almost impossible. So I think that's probably going to be getting even worse for the next generation growing up with TikTok, but uh, at least I wouldn't want to deliberately pass it on to anyone. Yeah, yeah, appreciate that totally. And Tommy, what about yourself? Yeah, so I, I guess maybe impatience. I actually told myself that I'm a very patient person, but I actually got, I asked some, you know, friends around and they said impatience. So I guess it's not always the same. And if I check some of my Telegram, 
messages, especially when things are very wild. Uh, it could probably, you know, line up with that thesis. But I think in general, just, you know, also kind of back to Jonathan's point, kind of being able in this, you know, ever more connected and uh, noisy world to just, you know, sit back and, you know, detach your ego and, you know, look at your feelings and everything kind of from a more objective perspective. So, you know, that's for like meditation and yoga and, you know, uh, mindfulness and even spirituality probably are like the things which I would like to explore further. Um, one which, okay, so which I would not like to the opposite of that pass on to uh, to the offering. So, yeah. yeah, I like it. Thanks for that uh, expounding as well. Can say uh, morning meditations definitely help with calming the body and setting, setting up your day. So 10 out of 10 recommend that one. Jonathan, I'm going to start you off on this one. Um, what did you do just before joining us on the podcast? Uh, I went to the gym, which is why I'm still wearing my athleisure uh, right now. Uh, nice. I was too sweaty to put on any uh, adult clothing, but that's usually a good way. Like whenever getting too stressed and taking a break and lifting some heavy stuff and getting back to it afterwards, after a while in the sauna, uh, then you can actually focus and stuff again. Oh, for sure. For all those listening on the podcast, make sure you go check us out on YouTube. You can see Jonathan's really cool camo shirt. Uh, <laughs> so go, go check that out. And, and tell me, what about you? Yeah, it was actually coordinating, helping some fellow Favarians uh, settling into Dubai for just a couple of weeks business trip. So you guys probably will, uh, you know, touch base with them as well. But we have two of our kind of ambassador program uh, leaders coming here, here for a short stint. So we're just uh, making sure that they have actually a roof on top of their heads. Luckily, one of our investors has a really cool kind of uh, hacker house type of accommodation. So I'll make sure they settle in there. Uh, well, in uh, like like tonight, uh, it's yeah 10 p.m. here. So that's why it looks a bit dark in uh, in this part of the world. For sure. Well, we definitely appreciate you staying late for the, for this show. Um, so I guess you kind of alluded to it, but what are you going to do after this podcast? Yeah, so basically, uh, so one of them is landing at, I think, 10 p.m. So probably will come online in, uh, in 15 minutes. So it's going to touch base with him. We'll probably actually do uh, morning training with him as well. So like doing this uh, Barry's Bootcamp is a good training. Uh, there's one in my building. So uh, yeah, just hitting, hitting the uh, ground running literally <laughs> tomorrow right. morning after. Next time Richard and I are in Dubai, you guys can count us in for some of these workouts. Um, we're, we've been, you know, that's part of our key to like survival on the road is getting these workouts in. And um, I also did F45 this morning. So, and I also, nice. uh, I guess I'll, I'll reveal, I did not shower before this podcast, but I think that <laughs> you both, you both managed to look very fresh and <laughs> straight out of. Uh, and what about you, uh, Jonathan, what you doing next? I guess the good answer would be work some more, but actually I'm looking forward to eating uh, this Danish that I have uh, as my reward for going to the gym. <laughs> nice. That'll be good. Well, Josh, uh, do we have any bonus questions for today? Yeah, we do have a bonus question for these guys. All right. So imagine going back to the 2000s. Is there one feature that would you would have loved in the social media sort of platform that wasn't available? I think it ties down pretty pretty uh, directly what we are actually building with the blockchain. So actually, you know, owning those some of the OG stuff that you put to Facebook, like you know, uh, literally it was just like yeah, I'm putting this stuff online and this content goes somewhere. But you know, if I would know that hey, I actually I'm gonna own, you know, this specific piece and that relationship, it would of course be you know uh, life changing, which I think speaks to, you know, why we believe so much into into what we are uh what we are building i'm honestly so happy that uh not everything on facebook oh, is on yes. yes like every two years you go through your university era pictures like that's no longer appropriate that's no longer appropriate was that ever appropriate and then you have to keep going through these rounds of censoring the content that you thought was okay when you were 20 something and realize that yeah. nowadays it probably get you canceled or at least ridiculed yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to ask, I'm, I'm going to add one other feature. I would like like a, 
like a, an AI prompt where it kind of goes through and, rec you know, suggests to me like, hey, do you really want this up anymore? Or should we just like remove this from the internet forever? And I, would, you know, some sort of like, you know, helpful feng shui type of assistant. I think that could be pretty cool. Most definitely. I think kind of uh, like what one thing looking back, especially on like Facebook beans or the primary social media of my university days is that I have 2,500 or something Facebook friends and now they're pretty much worth nothing because nobody is on Facebook anymore actively. So they're just sitting there and I could maybe like find them on Messenger, but I have no idea what they've been doing for the last 10 years and I have no way to connect those connections to anywhere else. So considering that there's always going to be cycles in social media, people are moving um, back and forth and uh, away from some platforms into some others, just getting the stuff that we're trying to do now with Lens and everybody else, like allowing you to take your contacts with you. So I would have a way to check what those folks are up to on the other platforms. Yeah, I, 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 I did that one. So I've been locked out of Facebook for six months because my T, 2FA isn't working and it can't be reset. Um, it's, it's a strange, strange issue where I keep back and forth with them, back and forth with them. And um, yeah, so literally I'm in the dark for anyone that was following me mainly on Facebook or I was following and communicating with mainly on Facebook. Um, I still love you. Um, I just can't communicate with you through that platform. And I have not seen any of your messages for over six months. But it's kind of, I have to say, it's kind of nice to to not, you know, have to be on Facebook. Um, I really haven't missed it that much. But I, you know, I have missed all your friends that talk to me on Facebook. I'm sorry about that. Um, guys, uh, this has been great. Um, we're, we're, we're so excited about what you guys are, are building and how it's coming along and, and sort of Clearly, the world needs this, so I uh, appreciate you all coming on the show and taking some time to break it down for us and for our listeners. i um, excited to sort of catch up with you guys. I think, you know, one month will be like nine months in the speed of favor uh, with sort of building out a social network and, and all the sort of tentacles that sort of come out of it over the next few months. In the meantime, where can our listeners go to learn more about you and the project you're working on? I think a good starting point is uh, favor.com. So P H A V E R, because uh, favor with an F would have been a too expensive domain back in the day. So went all 80s rapper on uh, the naming. And that's nice. going to lead you to download the app on iTunes or like iOS App Store or Play Store. Nice. And, and, and you guys have an X uh, handle, I'm sure, as well. Yep, at favor app. And you can find all of our socials also on the website, so you can follow the right ones. We've invested in that expensive yellow tick, so you know which one is legitimate. Nice, but but technically, what we really want them to do is then download the app and follow you guys on, on the favorite app, right? Yes, and hopefully follow you guys as well. We need to onboard you properly. Let's yeah. let's do it. Um, Absolutely, I'm, I'm all I'm all about that. Well, guys. We yeah. By the way, I think I think I think you guys should also create the um, you know the community, whether NFT gated gated or not. Um, we will also just as a humble brag, just won today the coinage project of the year, and I think you know the the goal here is to build like you know these media partner communities as well, uh, especially when there is an NFT component within favor. So that's kind of like what's what's cooking up on 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 the background, but um yeah definitely like that's 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 the end goal but yeah there's discord as well where you can go and have slack type of chat with like 150k people all right well, well we're on it um thank you everyone we have reached the outer limit at the edge of nft for today thanks for exploring with us we've got space for more adventures on the starship so invite your friends and recruit some cool strangers that will make this journey also much better how if you're listening go to spotify or itunes right now Rate us and say something awesome. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and pass this episode on to a friend or two. Lastly, be sure to tune in next time for more great Web3 content. Thanks again for sharing this time with us today.
The views and opinions expressed on Edge of NFT reflect solely those views and opinions of the show hosts and its guests. Please make sure to do your own research. Our show is not financial advice. You understand that you are using any and all information available on or through this podcast at your own risk. Whenever making financial decisions, we recommend doing your own research and talking to your accountant for financial advice. From time to time, we may feature sponsored content on the show for which we receive value, and we may share links for which we receive a commission if you make a purchase through one of those links. Refer to our website, www.edgeofnft.com, for our full disclaimer, terms and conditions, and privacy policy.